Hello and welcome to News Clicks International Roundup. Today we'll be discussing the state of the global leadership while facing the COVID-19 pandemic as well as political developments in Israel. To talk more about this, we have with us Prabir Prakash. Prabir, thank you for joining us. So, uh, first of all, let's talk about the global leadership about and COVID-19. So, on Thursday, the G20 leaders met by virtually, of course, and there was a lot of speculation regarding they would be whether there would be a concerted action plan. Almost all the G20 countries are severely affected by the pandemic. But at the end, the statement was what is called anodyne, very regular. There was no serious, uh, there was no specific initiative. And the, even the announcement of $5 trillion seems more a reflection of domestic spending rather than any concerted international effort. So has the G20 once again failed to sort of step up to the occasion? You know, G20 today lacks a coherent leadership and a coherent vision in any case how to act on international issues. We have seen the division of the world earlier in terms of the Cold War, where you had, you know, the socialist bloc and you had a bloc around NATO, which was basically declaring that that the two systems cannot co cohabit, coexist, except for the period when they decided, okay, we could still work together. Okay, so you had disarmament, you had some moves of that direction. Post 90s, it was a, a global hegemony of one superpower, and they declared victory and decided they could now remold the globe in their image or whatever they, the image they wanted. But that having passed its prime, we haven't seen a coherent global order emerge. We have a, now a breakdown of the trade regime. The financial system has been at loggerheads because the United States does not want to relinquish. All the Western, other Western powers do not want to relinquish their control, the overriding control they have of the global financial system, including the IMF and the World Bank. So all of this is the precursor why you see a dysfunctional response by the G20. And the United States having effectively sabotaged the United Nations as well, as well as the UN uh, Security Council, which they don't, they say that they, that they don't accept its uh, uh, legal authority, while they want others to accept it. So we have a strange situation where we have a superpower which thinks it has global hegemony, but it really does not. And I think the pandemic has put this crisis much more sharply. That the U.S. causes the understanding of uh, the world order in each in which to dictate to various countries. That at least the virus doesn't seem to accept that. Right. So we have the need for a global response, but we have no mechanism for a global response. And the G20 hasn't done therefore anything either. Partly because if you want any of these things to work. You have to have a pre-prepared action plan which the leaders can then endorse. And no such work has happened. And the only thing that has happened is endorsement of WHO in some sense. But as you know, WHO also does not have the financial base today. Right. They are in fact dependent a lot on private largest of organizations like Bill and Melinda Gates. And that also is not geared for public health but more towards addressing what I call the ill health regime. The people who are sick, how do you handle them? Right. But that's not really public health. And that came out largely because in a very sharp way in the pandemic, when you saw that the vaccine program needed external help. It could not be done by WHO. It could not be done by nation the countries depending on private sector. Then you had this global health initiatives which came essentially from pooling money from various foundations and some governments into vaccine initiatives. And I think the pandemic has shown that the major thrust now should be on global efforts to bring out quickly a prophylactic, something which can be used, not vaccine. Vaccine, of course, is the ultimate prophylactic. Some medicine which will work in the short run, what is being called repurposing drugs, with existing drugs, and then, of course, the vaccine. This is the global health system, but it, could, it also needs to be backed up by ventilators, by basically life-saving equipment. And how do you have a global supply chain doing that? What is being called personal protective gear? If you don't protect your hospital staff, 
how do you face the first wave, the second wave of the infections which are likely to come? Because that's your front line of defense. And that those are the kind of things, at least, they could have taken a far more integrated approach. But I don't see anything right. really that spells any of it out. So it's still what I would call beggar thy neighbor policy. Each country will be looking for itself without any global solidarity or a global effort. Right. In fact, President Xi of China had suggested that the G20 health ministers meet and have some sort of a joint strategy to address this issue, but nothing seems to have come. And the US seems to, even now, despite having the highest number of cases in the world, be focused on calling it a Chinese virus and proceeding in that direction, which even its allies are hesitant to endorse because the previous day we saw the G7 foreign ministers the allies, with the, Met and the, the allies with the U.S. refused to endorse a statement which said the, it's a Wuhan virus. So, despite the fact that China is probably in a position to really help, it doesn't look like, especially the U.S. is wants to actually promote that sort of cooperation. Yes, I think that's the challenge the U.S. now faces. It does not have the global hegemony. And on the question of the COVID-19, it's not only not in a position to help, but it requires other people to give it equipment, fly swaps from, for instance, Italy, and so on. Right. Now, given that, that China is in a position to help, while U.S. is not, they are in a difficult wicket how to prevent that from happening. And that's possibly one of the reasons to flag continuously the Chinese virus and the Wuhan virus, continue the vilification campaign without addressing today that if you want kits, you want ventilators, you want masks, well, China is at least in a position to do it. And let's not forget, a huge amount of what I call APIs, the bug drugs, as we used to call them, they come from China today, and every country in the world is going to need it. So supply chains, how do you build global supply chains, is the key issue. And as you know, the United States is not only is not accepting any of that, that if you work it out globally, but it believes that it has the financial and other cloud to get things for itself. But as you uh, as you can see, even different states in the U.S. don't seem to agree with President Trump on that. Right. So the U.S. willingness to work internationally comes from its basic understanding that private sector will solve all the problems and markets will. But the biggest failures come when you have a public policy which demands really public interventions and not just markets. And I think the epidemics and pandemics are really that. And moving on to the other, another major development or even maybe as the Israelis would like to call it, the fall, another fallout of COVID-19. We see that the political system there is completely changed over the past few days. Benny Gantz and Benjamin Netanyahu over the past couple of years have been portrayed as these arch rivals, you know, who are uh, two poles of the polity, so to speak. And after three rounds of elections, we see that suddenly Gantz is dismantled his blue and white alliance and now join hands with Netanyahu, who was, who was being portrayed as his arch rival till now. And this basically means that Netanyahu is back in power for at least two, three years. And even some, even two weeks ago, there was a speculation that he was going to be out. Gantz would be the prime minister, supported by the Arab list. So how do you see this? Is is it as sudden a U-turn as people are portraying it, or was it inevitable? Well, the point that is, that is there is that Gantz was hoping that after three rounds, the pressure of having the Arab list supported government would force the Likud to really rethink its leadership and change its leadership. And therefore, that was what the last three rounds really was about, that Gantz pressure that if Likud doesn't go with Netanyahu, then there could be an alliance, but not with Netanyahu. I think Netanyahu really forestalled that by getting what people would uh, is calling a COVID coup, that he effectively seized power under emergency measures. They call it that this COVID-19 requires emergency, and therefore now everything is stopped, everything is closed, and I have the power. You see, he cannot afford to be even five days without being the prime minister, because if he is, then he is the, the constitutional protection that he cannot be uh, taken to court for or indicted, then that falls apart. 
Okay, so I think his interest was how does he prevent that? And he has held the COVID-19 emergency coup as a sledgehammer against the GANs, and GANs has really submitted. But let me be clear, both sections do not want the Arab list to be supporting the Prime Minister. So the, these are all maneuvers which GANs was doing to put pressure on Likud and Netanyahu. As I said, Likud's interests and Netanyahu's interests are not identical in this case, because Netanyahu needs to be the Prime Minister. Likud can have other Prime Ministers too, but I think in this particular context, Netanyahu has seen that he then remains at the helm, so he cannot be indicted. So he's got time for himself for another two to three years, and as you know, in three years a lot can change. Exactly. Anyway, Gang's coalition is disintegrating, and he will not be regarded credible in the future. But the underlying problem is the Arab list, basically the pan of, uh, what would be called the citizens of the of historical Palestine would never be allowed into the government, is basically the consensus among the Zionist population. And let's face it, the Zionist population, and I'm not calling it the Jewish population, the Zionist population who wants essentially a state in which the Palestinians should, the original Palestinian inhabitants should not have any rights. This is the one which still is the majority, unfortunately, among the Jewish population, and that is increasingly going to make it very difficult to have or reverse the process of this kind of state formation, which is essentially a Zionist you know, uh, state, which excludes the Palestinian, original Palestinian inhabitants from the political structure. Thank you so much for being here talking to us. Thank <laughs> you.